Truman's get a temporary White House. It's the State Department's Blair House, just across Pennsylvania Avenue from the traditional executive mansion, now closed for repairs. Though President Truman and his family are vacationing in Florida, the presidential furniture is already being moved in. When it was recently discovered that the White House was in immediate danger of falling apart, the State Department's official guest home was commandeered for the Trumans. President Truman is fated to start his second administration, where he began his first, at Blair House, his home after the death of President Roosevelt. America's foremost medical scientists and administrators received the American Public Health Association's Lasker Awards. Mrs. Mary Lasker and Dr. George Baer, head of New York Academy of Medicine, present the medical Oscars in Boston. Dr. René Dubot gets his for helping in the discovery of streptomycin. Others go to the drug's discoverer, Dr. Selman Waxman, to the Veterans Administration Medical Chiefs, and finally to Dr. Martha Elliott for her wartime U.S. Children's Bureau aid program. The purpose of these awards is to acknowledge distinguished efforts in combating the most important causes of disease and of death. Hollywood's latest super colossal movie opens in New York City. Film fans jam the streets for a glimpse of star Ingrid Bergman, scheduled to attend the benefit premiere. Radio's Jinx Falkenberg interviews Walter Wanger, producer of the $9 million production, his film star wife Joan Bennett, and their daughter. Next, Miss Bergman with the film's director, Victor Fleming. Broadway gives Hollywood's most ballyhooed new picture a real Hollywood welcome. American housewives will throw $2 million down the drain next year, learns Mrs. America of 1948, Maria Strohmeyer. That's the value of canned food fluids wasted annually. And to dramatize the point, the National Canners Association borrows $2 million in cash from a Chicago bank. This is the money value of the liquid that came with canned vegetables and other foods and is thrown away. The cold cash, one of the largest collections of greenbacks ever displayed, makes the canner's warning hard to forget. Puerto Rico elects its first governor, Luis Munoz Marin, shown with his family at their home, ends the reign of American appointed officials who have governed the island since Spain ceded it to the United States in 1899. Governor Munoz is the founder and head of the island's dominant popular Democratic Party. The liberal former editor assumes office as the territory takes another step along the road to American statehood. Columbia University scientists play with their new atom smasher at Irvington on Hudson, New York. They have an unscientific high time with the new $2 million cyclotron, the most powerful magnet in the world. Unable to show the cyclotron at work on atoms, they use these metal rods to demonstrate the action of the magnet. The metal objects tend to line themselves up parallel with the direction of the field, in the same manner that a magnetic compass needle parallels the Earth's magnetic field and points to the North Pole. A seemingly supernatural stunt illustrates the great magnetic pull, which will separate potent protons from the atom. Even three men have a hard time pulling a chain from the heart of the great cyclotron. It's quite an experience for usually blasé newsreel cameramen and source of new occupational hazards. This cameraman will have to learn a little more about coping with the new atomic age. Texas battles Texas Christian at Fort Worth. TCU's Lindy Berry skirts in for seven yards. Determined to win their first game at home this season, the Horned Frogs send Captain Pete Stout over for a score. They lead at halftime, seven to nothing. Third period, Randall Clay of Texas bucks for five yards. The other Longhorn running star, Ray Borneman, dances through the line and he's on his way. Traveling 60 yards, he spins away from potential tacklers to tie the score. Texas is still in the race for the Southwest Conference title. TCU takes to the air. Berry flings one, but it misses its mark as co-captain Dick Harris intercepts for Texas. Paul Campbell throws a spot pass to Clay. It clicks deep in TCU territory. 
Fourth down on the two. Guillory Byron heads for the flag and dives over. Texas comes from behind to win 14 to 7. Undefeated Army rumbles into Franklin Field for a tussle with Penn. Stalled in the first period, the Quakers kick. It's out of bounds on the eight-yard line. West Point deep in its own territory. Arnold Galippa fumbles. Penn's Totkarczyk recovers. Pennsylvania one yard away. Ray Dooney throws a jump pass to Bob Sponigal for the first score. The surprise crowd goes wild. Earl Blake's 11 fights back. Gillipa whips to Dave Parrish for 18 yards. Striking with all its power, Army sends Winfield Scott around end and into the clear. 48 yards for Army's tying touchdown. Second quarter, Penn punts, and again, Army is in trouble as Frank Fischel fumbles the ball out of bounds. Looks like a repeat of the first quarter. Galippa again fumbles, and the Quakers recover. Dooney drives over for Penn's second touchdown. Trailing 14 to 13 in the second half, Army moves again. It's Galippa to Trent for 16 yards. Bobby Jack Stewart gallops wide and nearly gets away. Caught this time, he tries the same play again. With good blocking, he goes across as Army finally leads 19 to 14. Three minutes to go in the game. Penn's Dooney again spins into the line, gets away, and dashes 42 yards to tally. Trailing by a point, the cadets are on the verge of defeat. Two minutes to play. Fischl connects with his first pass as the brilliant Trent grabs it. The West Point powerhouse electrifies the crowd with its rally. Stewart bowls his way for 12 more yards. One minute left. Galiffa fades. No receiver is open. He finally throws. Parrish leaps at the 16 for a spectacular catch. 30 seconds remaining. Galiffa again, a desperation heave into the end zone. Trent is there for the catch. Army takes command, but the game isn't over yet. Captain Bill Yeoman kicks off. The cadet defensive platoon charges downfield. Bill Rhodes brings it back. He fakes a reverse and heads for the sidelines. For a moment, he seems to be able to get away, but he's caught at midfield. Four seconds before the final gun, another long pass. It's intercepted by Bobby Vinson, and Army pulls the game out of the fire 26 to 20. 